Good afternoon, and welcome to our October meeting of the Board of Regents of the University of Michigan. I'm going to call roll Regent Acker, Present. Regent Beam, Here. Regent Bernstein, Present. Regent Brown, Here. Regent Hubbard, Here. Regent Illich, Here. Regent Weiser, Here. Regent White. Here. I want to begin by saying how excited and honored I am to be chairing my first board meeting and doing so here at the University of Michigan Flint. Thank you. My first meeting with the board was in July when I was appointed. And I'll never forget, <clears throat> excuse me, that day. I again wanna thank the regents for their confidence in me. Being president of the University of Michigan is a great honor and privilege. And while she is not here, I want to acknowledge President Emerita, Mary Sue Coleman, for her guidance and a smooth transition. She spent many hours with me and was very patient in our conversations, and I'm very grateful to her. I appreciate all of our conversations and her advice. Looking ahead, these first few weeks and months as president are so critical for me. I am very much in a listening mode as I meet people on all of our campuses. I have so much respect for our faculty, staff, and students that it would be a mistake to begin my presidency by announcing, this is what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do, and my most important job right now, is to listen to the community. That includes everyone here at the University of Michigan Flint, where we are taking our first steps to transform the institution collaboratively with you. I'm aware of the hard work ahead for all of us. University of Michigan Flint is very important and must assert itself academically and financially. And I am grateful to Chancellor Deba Dutta for his leadership and to the faculty, staff, and students who are so committed to University of Michigan Flint's future. <laughs> We all want the Flint campus to thrive. I'm particularly pleased that the chancellor is hosting office hours to hear directly from the community. This is in addition to many meetings he has had across the campus. All of us play a role in the success of University of Michigan Flint. I will personally return to Flint next month on November 4th. And I look forward to learning more about what makes this campus so special to so many people. Later in November, I'm planning my first major address to the entire university community. While it's very early in my tenure, I wanna share my values as president and some initial priorities with everyone in that address. And there will be plenty of time for discussion. I'm looking forward to it, so please mark your calendars for the morning of November the 17th. And on December the 5th, I plan to visit the University of Michigan Dearborn campus. And I'm anticipating good conversations with Chancellor Grasso and the students, faculty, and staff there. I wanna take a moment to congratulate Vice President Ravi Penzi who will be honored tomorrow with a 2022 Michigan Leadership Orby Award. As our Chief Information Officer, Dr. Penzi is being recognized by his CIO peers statewide for his excellence in technology leadership. Ravi, congratulations, and thank you for everything that you do for the university. Let's hear it for Ravi.
Before we turn to today's agenda, I want the community to know that I have heard the concerns about how we address compliance and prevent issues of misconduct on this campus. This is incredibly important to me, and I know it's important to the Board of Regents. The university has made significant improvements in the last couple of years. This includes forming our equity, civil rights, and Title IX office, and an ethics, integrity, and compliance committee. In addition, we've accelerated our anti-retaliation work and established the Coordinated Community Response Team. And we are deep into a campus-wide culture journey to identify and reinforce our values as an institution. I'm extremely grateful for the work being carried out on all three campuses, as well as within Michigan Medicine, with regards to ethics and compliance. To continue our momentum and commitment to rebuilding trust, I want us to establish a central ethics, integrity, and compliance office. I see this as an opportunity to widen our focus on an institutional basis. I want this new office to support the many efforts already underway and the staff who do this important work every day. This office will have a dual reporting line to the president and, when necessary, the vice president and general counsel of the university. It also will have a dotted line report to the chair, to the full board of regents, and will regularly report to the full board. Should there be any issue involving the president or his or her office, the Central Compliance Office will report solely to the Vice President and General Counsel and then to the Board of Regents. This office will examine trends, processes, areas of concern, and overall ethics, integrity, and compliance issues. It will be independent. It will not serve as a Court of Appeals to review decisions by ECRT, or human resources, or deans, or directors, and supervisors, and academic HR, among others. I need to hear from the community about how best to structure this office. Over the next months, I will be listening to deans, executive officers, faculty, staff, and the broader university community to help inform my decisions regarding this independent office. And I want to talk with those who engage in compliance work every day. I will then bring a detailed plan forward to the board. We have made important progress and a independent central compliance office will be one more step towards keeping our community safe. All of this work makes a positive difference. Thanks again for your support and faith in me. Before I move on to the chair of the Board of Regents, I'd like to ask the Chancellor to give some brief remarks as host of today's meeting. Thank you, President Ono. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the University of Michigan Flint. It is a real pleasure to host the Board of Regents every fall, but this year we are especially honored to be the site of your inaugural board meeting. So on behalf of U of M Flint, faculty, staff, and students, we welcome you to U of M Flint and to the University of Michigan. We are excited not only because you are a Wolverine now, but for what lies ahead for all our campuses. Both U of M Flint and Greater Flint area are uniquely diverse communities that appreciate and benefit from the melting pot of ideas, perspectives, and education that each share with the other. It is a symbiotic relationship between the university and the community that is both positively impacting the community and providing meaningful hands-on learning experiences for U of M Flint students from multiple programs. The Board of Regents know well that what we do at 
UM Flint matters. It matters to our students, matters to the people in the communities we serve. We are not only making a difference, but we are also making ourselves and the community stronger as a result. Once again, President Nono, we welcome you to U of M Flint and to the Board of Regents as well, and look forward to working with both the board and the president to build a better tomorrow for this university and the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chancellor. Now over to the chair of the Board of Regents, Ch Chair Brown. Thank you, President Ono. I just want to personally say how excited I am to have you here chairing your first meeting, and especially here on the Flint uh, campus. Um, when we saw how the schedule was going to work out in the first meeting of uh, your new presidency was going to be on the Flint campus, there was some talk of, oh, do we need to move it uh, to Ann Arbor? And uh, the president's office very clearly said, absolutely not. Uh, this is the perfect place to have my first meeting. And so thank you again for for having it here. Um, I want to speak briefly on two subjects. Um, the first is the U of M Flint transformation. Um, I want to underscore the board's support for the strategic transformation process underway at U of M Flint. Um, many uh, want uh, this to be uh, successful, but no one wants this campus to be successful more than the Board of Regents. Uh, it's critically important that faculty, staff, and students from Flint campus and members of the greater Flint community engage in this process, and I urge you to participate through the various um, engagement opportunities uh, that Chancellor Dutta has created. Uh, we need everyone to bring their ideas to the table in order to develop a path forward uh, for this campus that meets the needs of the U of M Flint students and which is sustainable. Secondly, uh, I'd like to comment on the creation of the Compliance Office. Uh, I want to be clear about this board's support for what President Ono uh, outlined today regarding his intent to create a Central Ethics, Integrity, and Compliance Office. Uh, this has been a priority for me and my colleagues on the Board of Regents. I especially want to thank President Ono uh, for making this one of his first initiatives as president. He has said he is spending his time listening to the community, and this is a demonstration of that. This kind of action builds trust, and that's what we need to do. This office, combined with many other improvements that have been implemented, most especially the creation of ECRT and anti-retaliation efforts, uh, will cement our comprehensive approach to addressing misconduct and other matters. I also want to note the ongoing culture change efforts that is critical component of the university's work. Each one of us in this community has a role to play in creating a safe, high integrity, inclusive culture. And I welcome all of you to do just that. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I don't know if other regions would like to comment. Yes. I, uh, I just want to add a few thoughts. I very much want to welcome and applaud President Ono for this vision. Uh, and this progressive leadership in this area. He uh, built an independent office at the University of Cincinnati and at UBC. So he's very experienced in this area, which gives me great comfort. This was one of the final recommendations of Guidepost Solutions, who did a great job for us. And I'm so happy that we'll be able to fulfill this final recommendation. This really fulfills a critical need for our university, a need for independence and safe reporting. And this includes the president's office as, the, as President Ono highlighted, and that's very critical based on our past experience. I also want to thank SACWA and the faculty uh, for their support and their work and their most recent resolution in supporting an independent office uh, for our university. It's interesting, today in the Detroit News, Judge Akalina, who is the judge that oversaw the Nasser case, wrote about the importance of prioritizing student safety on campus with an accountable administrative structure. So she went on to say that a full 32% of all college students nationwide report forcible sexual offenses. She writes that we know the actual number is significantly higher because many victims of assault do not report or go to the police. 
the Race, Abuse, and Incest National Organization, reports that sexual violence is the most prevalent crime on college campuses, and those between the ages of 18 and 24 are at an elevated risk. So this announcement, the changes we've already implemented, and president owner's leadership gives me enormous confidence in our future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> and I also just want to start by welcoming you uh, to the front of this board table. I, I know this will be one of many, many fruitful meetings that we have, and we look forward to your your service as president. Um, beyond what my colleagues have already said, and I don't want to repeat it, um, but the other person, in addition to um, our faculty or staff um, and, that, uh, and students that have weighed in on this, is uh, Regent Illich, uh, who began this push as board chair. And I, I think it's wonderful to sit here two years later and now see the final fruits of that labor start to, to occur. Um, it's going to be a great thing for our university. And uh, it wouldn't have happened without your dogged support. So thank you. Thank you. Yes. President, thank you. I, I also just want to very briefly uh, recognize, thank, and express gratitude to, to Denise, to Region, sorry, Region Village, uh, and Jordan, <laughs> Region Hecker. The two of you uh, were just uh, uh, strident about <laughs> your, your demand for us to be blind. And um, this is a, an important step in in the right direction it's it's one, a step among many steps that this that we've taken as an institution and president i'm thrilled that uh in your first meeting you in many respects helped us cross in some ways a finish line but also a starting line we have a lot of in every institution uh, in our society has a lot of work to do here but now we i think we finished moving around a lot of furniture right this is a huge uh piece of a puzzle that will help us um, ensure that um, this is a campus where uh, this type of activity just is not tolerated. It can be reported easily and smoothly and efficiently and independently and thrilled to support it. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, we're going to move on to committee reports now. And uh, the first committee report is Finance, Audit, and the Investment Committee. I call on Regent Hubbard. Thank you, President Owen. The Finance, Audit, and Investment Committee, including co-chair Regent Weiser and members White and Brown, met to get an update on the fiscal year 22 performance and to speak with our external auditors. Investments had a 2.2% return for the year, which is a really great return on the relative basis and among the highest for large university endowments, with most reporting losses for the year. So kudos to our investment team. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, move on then to the Health Affairs Committee with Regent Bernstein. Thank you. Uh, the Health Affairs Committee, including members uh, Illich, Weiser, Brown, I think Regent Acker also joined us as well, met for an update on operational improvement initiatives currently underway in the adult hospital aimed to improve quality of care and access. We also discussed our ongoing statewide system partnerships. Thank you very much. And the Committee on Flint and Dearborn, Regent Beam. Thank you, President Ono. Uh, the Committee on Flint and Dearborn met yesterday uh, and received updates uh, for both campuses. Uh, we almost had the full board at this board subcommittee. Uh, and there was also an extensive uh, discussion on the Flint campus transformation process. Thank you very much. The minutes and reports are on the website for anyone interested. We move now on to the reports. Next, we hear from VP Harmon who has something special to share with regarding student life. Thank you, President Ono. You know, one never knows how you might react to surprises, but there was a great surprise announcement on national television this morning that I'm gonna celebrate. The university's own Dr. Fermi Ogilami, the Director of Student Accessibility and Accommodation Services, who is better known as Dr. O, was highlighted this morning on the Good Morning America program for the adaptive sports program that he leads on our campus. National anchor Robin Roberts surprised Dr. O with his family and friends on our athletic campus. He was awarded a $1 million gift from the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation in support of his initiative regarding adaptive sports and upholding diversity, equity, and inclusion. Now that's a surprise that's worth celebrating 
and one that our students will benefit from. So congratulations to Dr. O, and thank you to the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation. Thank you. That's wonderful news. Thank you, VP Harmon, for that report. Now on to the Dearborn Campus Report, Chancellor Grasso. Thank you, President Ono. First, I would like to express a warm and enthusiastic welcome to you from everyone on the Dearborn campus. I would also like to thank Chancellor Dutta and his team for their gracious hospitality in hosting this meeting. I'm happy to report that our, that our fall enrollments remain strong with an overall increase in new students of 1.2%. This semester, we've launched many new initiatives in the diversity and inclusion space, including a Chancellor's Inclusive Excellence Fellowship Program. Administered from my office, the new research initiative is designed to promote collaboration between faculty and administration on a variety of diversity issues. Our first two fellows are Terry Laws, Associate Professor of African and African American Studies, who will explore student cases that trigger early academic warnings. She will also work to evaluate how new recruitment and hiring policies will improve diversity in the faculty ranks. Hafiz Malik, Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering, will help faculty recruit increased numbers of students to work on research projects in lieu of their common trajectories of working in restaurants and retail outlets. We've also resumed our Thought Leader series this semester with specific focus on DEI. Earlier this week, we hosted Scott Page, a distinguished university professor of complexity here on the Ann Arbor, not here, back in the Ann Arbor <laughs> campus, uh, he delivered a well-attended and engaging talk on the benefits of building diverse teams through a systems analysis lens, what he calls the diversity bonus. Next month, we will welcome President Clayton Spencer and Professor April Hill from Bates College, who will discuss purposeful work and STEM equity. Later in the semester, Professor Desmond Patton from Penn will speak on the use of data science and data science to understand the impact of social media on mental health and adults of color. We recently have started a collaboration with Tony Kolinick, director of the Methai Botanical Garden, the Nichols Arboretum, to help us reimagine our environmental interpretive center uh, and study area on the Dearborn campus. On November 17th, we will be hosting a renaming ceremony of our university center honoring our fourth chancellor, James C. Renner. And finally, and by no means least, our first town gown bike ride was a success. Dearborn Mayor Abdul Abdullah Hamoud and I hosted uh, almost 80 cyclists and some walkers on a slow roll through campus and West Dearborn last month, ending with an enjoyable picnic by the Chancellor's Pond. Thank you, go blue and go Dearborn. <laughs> Thank you, Chancellor Grasso. Uh, we now go to the Flint campus report, Chancellor Dutton. Thank you, President Nono. U of M Flint pay, plays a, a, a pivotal role in the lives of its students and by extension in this region. Education empowers individuals to better understand who they are and what they want to do with their lives. Our excellent faculty instill in our students not only a curiosity for learning, but also a process for learning a mindset for accepting challenges, finding solutions. But our faculty do more. They help create the next generation of U of M Flint students. For example, U of M Flint biology program partnered with Formart Nature Preserve and Arboretum nearby to host a bio blitz for K-12 students. In this program, students identify and learn about plants, animals, insects, reptiles during hikes through the nature preserve. Such programs help create the future climate scientists and sustainability researchers. In Michigan, we all know that fewer students are graduating with teaching degrees and fewer people are becoming teachers. So today, over 220 high school students from across Genesee County are on campus attending the Teacher Leadership Symposium. 
They are here to learn about the teaching profession. This event is hosted by our School of Education and Human, Re uh, Human Services in partnership with the Greater Flint Education Consortium and the Genesee Intermediate School District. UM Flint's impact in the region is evidenced by Flint and Genesee groups, which is the chamber equivalent, inaugural 40 under 40, which spotlights young professionals leading the way in shaping the future of the Flint area. This list includes 15 UM and Flint alumni and two current students. And now I want to give an update on the strategic transformation process that we launched last month. It is off to a very good start. We have had outreach with many stakeholders who appreciate the open lines of communication. Since September 23, the day it was launched, I have had 21 meetings, town halls, small groups, and one-on-one. -on -one. These meetings have been with U of M, all U of M Flint college and school faculty through town halls. In some cases, additional meetings with their leadership teams. The library faculty, we are meeting next week, Wednesday. We have met with the faculty senate council and additional meetings with the leadership. We have met with the staff council and additional meetings with the leadership. We have met with the student government and additional meetings with the leadership. Next week, they have invited me to play, uh, to give comments and hear uh, from the state of the students event, which is an annual event. I have met with the SACUA leadership in Ann Arbor. I have met with our cabinet, the senior leadership team at U of M Flint. I have met with several officials, the public officials in the region. The next week is busy as well. There is meetings with the Citizens Advisory Committee, local foundations group, Genesee Intermediate School District. There has also been good traffic on the website. As of Tuesday, over 5,700 views to the website. More than 75 direct communications received with ideas, suggestions, questions, and concerns. Each of these are reviewed by the communication teams for input and addition to the FAQ, if appropriate, or to communicate the emerging themes through my campus messages. The steering, the steering committee has been formed, as has the Innovation and Transformation Advisory Council, ITAC, a group consisting of faculty chosen by each school, college, libraries, and representation from staff and the Faculty Senate Council. We are now preparing for focus groups and curating surveys to solicit, uh, to solicit feedback from the campus community. In the coming weeks, we will organize, we are in the planning stages now, several alumni and community forums in different parts of the city. The first one is on the north side next week, Monday, to ensure that their voices are heard and they are engaged as we create a vision for the future of the university, our people, our region. But this is the role of a public university, to serve its students so that they may in turn serve their communities. It is a reciprocal relationship, if not a trust, in one another that is as old as the public university itself. Together, we will erase what holds us back and embrace what moves us forward to fulfill the dreams of a new generation of students and fuel the success of this region. Together then, together now, and together in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mayor Brown? Again, just briefly, Chancellor Dutta, I know that I or none of us will get everything we want out of this transformation process, but the Regents and I uh, asked you, if not demanded, that you create the most open collaborative process uh, in the history of higher education. 
<laughs> I, after hearing that list, I, I am now fairly confident that you are doing just that. So thank you again and, and keep it up. Uh, thank you. Thank and you very much. Region Wiser. Region Wiser. Wiser. As the senior region in age, but not service, I would like to make sure that all in this room know that all eight regions support Deba and his efforts, Chancellor Deba and his efforts to transform the U of M Flint for the future. Thank you. And uh, as the junior region on the board, <laughs> I had to get that in there, in age, but not service either. <laughs> I also want to uh, reiterate that this board is incredibly supportive of the plan that you are, the plans you are undertaking, and we look forward to celebrating the future success of UVM Flint with you. Thank you. Other comments? As the new president of the University of Michigan, I want you to congratulate you on everything you've done, and to say publicly that I'm fully supportive of you, Chancellor. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, we now turn to the uh, student government report um, and the Flint student government president, Timothy Brooks has a report. Timothy. Good afternoon, regents, President Ono, executive officers and members of the audience. I would like to start by welcoming our newest president of the University of Michigan, Dr. Ono, to our wonderful campus. For him to experience his first Regents meeting on our campus is a great honor. We are incredibly hopeful for this institution's future under his stewardship of the university moniker. I hope he can continue to usher in times of great innovation and learning throughout the university's campuses. I was asked by our Chancellor Dutta to help explain U of M Flint from a student's perspective. At this campus, I'm not only a student, but more importantly, a representative of all students here. I have been a student here for almost two years as a transfer student from a community college. Being a transfer student, I represent a significant number of students on this campus. I transferred here in January, 2021. And since then, this institution has been a transformational experience for me personally and professionally. In my professional role as representative of the student body, I am tasked with being the voice of students. In this role, I am pursuant to the needs of the students and our community. This past month, the Chancellor's announced a strategic transformation project that promises to help allow our regional comprehensive campus to remain a comprehensive campus while becoming a viable engine for social and economic change in the city. Student government looks forward to working in concert with him, as well as all of you, to make sure that this project is executed in a manner that is more transparent and well-informed for the students. Student government this year has been working hard to engage our community. We are achieving this through our community outreach by volunteering at our local food bank, distributing food in the community, and informing citizens and students alike about the importance of voting. We are working to show our, that our students are committed to the city we learn in. We wanna increase our campus outreach to the community to allow its residents to understand that college can be a viable and affordable path to improve their lives an effort that we need your help in continuing by placing greater priority on community involvement within this project. My education journey has been a little different than most. Previously, when I attended community college, I worked a full-time job while going to school full-time to afford tuition. I decided that when I transferred here, I was gonna spend my first semester getting as involved as possible, something that I didn't have the opportunity to do previously. Through my involvement, I've become a better leader, a better listener, and a better learner. This involvement has allowed me to gain scholarships that have enabled me to continue my degree. This is why I'm highlighting the need for affordable tuition. This campus has given me incredible opportunities that I wouldn't have been able to had I gone elsewhere. Because through this school, I have been able to meet an incredibly diverse group of students who helped me succeed into the great student I am today. And as that great student and a resident of Flint, I'm here to be a representative of what Flint students are capable of. I'm currently a Dean's List student and the president of student government, a role I pursued due to my fresh perspective of U of M Flint that I realized that many of the problems faced, that I was faced as a student were small and fixable, and that this institution has an incredible amount of potential to transform into something truly great. This institution is something that has the opportunity to rise the tide and with it, all the ships within Flint's waters. I believe that with the robust support of the Regents and President Ono, the Flint campus can become a nimble institution that adapts quickly to the needs of the students 
As we forge the future of this campus, I believe this campus can become a better, more inclusive, community-oriented engine of socioeconomic change for its home city. I'm sure that all of you believe in times like this, great opportunities exist. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, uh, Timothy, that was wonderful. We have one personnel action and I call upon Provost McCauley to comment. Thank you, President Oh no, I'm pleased to share that the University of Michigan had five faculty selected for membership in the National Academy of Medicine at its annual meeting this past weekend. This is well above our typical number. The National Academy of Medicine is the highest honorary society in the country for colleagues in the fields of health and medicine. These faculty include Catherine Gallagher, the John R. Pfeiffer Professor of Surgery and Professor of Microbiology and Immunology, Michelle Heisler, Professor of Internal Medicine and Professor of Health Behavior and Health Education in the School of Public Health, Sachin Ketterpal, Professor of Anesthesiology and the Kevin K. Trumper Research Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology, Anna Sukhong Luck, the Dame Shelia Sherlock, Distinguished University Professor of Hepatology and Internal Medicine, and the Alice Lorman Andrews Research Professor of Hepatology, and Bramar Mukherjee, the John D. Kalkweish Collegiate Professor of Biostatistics, Professor of Epidemiology, and Professor of Global Public Health in the School of Public Health. We celebrate these distinguished faculty members on this tremendous accomplishment. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to the retirement memoirs and there are six uh, faculty members that we have adopted the retirement memoirs. Those uh, materials are, are uh, in the package uh, that you have before you. We now move on to the uh, consent agenda. I call for a vote on the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Motion uh, passes uh, unanimously. We now move on to the regular agenda. First to finance and property. Uh, and uh, I turn to item number two, the University of Michigan financial statements for the year end June 30th. 2022 and turn to EVP Chattis. Nothing to add, Mr. President. Thank you very much. Call for a vote. Is there a motion? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Motion passes. We now move on to item three, the new building for the College of Pharmacy. I ask uh, EVP Chattis to comment. We are pleased to introduce a project to create a new College of Pharmacy building. The College of Pharmacy is consistently ranked number three nationally, and I would like to acknowledge the leadership of Dean Vicki Ellingrod, who is here today. The new building will allow the consolidation of faculty and students from five locations into one, providing contemporary research classrooms and student collaboration spaces. The project was placed on hold during the pandemic financial restrictions and the two-year delay impacted the cost due to escalation and current market conditions. Therefore, we request to increase the budget from $121 million to $141 million with funding from reserves and gifts. The building was designed two years ago ahead of PCCN targets, yet the building will exceed energy code by 20%. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions by 20%, and it includes the use of timber to reduce embodied carbon and cost as compared to steel and construction. And it is targeted for LEED gold certification. The architect Benjamin Kroll from RDG Planning and Design will now present the project schematic design. Thank you very much. I'm pleased to present the design for the new College of Pharmacy, which will provide modern research and teaching space for the, college, the college's important mission. Our firm's mission is create meaning together. High quality design translates the, the mastery of education and research performance. This building will support those efforts. As we learned during design, research completed by the faculty contributed to FDA approved medications with efficacy against COVID. 
Research at this university saves lives, and we are honored to be a part of that. We'll start with the site plan. Uh, the building is located on the central campus in the corner of East Huron and Glen Avenue. The tight urban site is as a 22 foot grade change provides accessible routes at the first and lower levels. Vertical movement is achieved through feature stairs, daylit egress stairs and elevators. The lower level, as you see here, uh, our design strategy was in, encouraged uh, in regards to flexibility, multi-program spaces and maximizing utilization. This floor plan, you can start to see teaching labs in green, offices in orange, and blue classrooms. Vertical movement is achieved through feature stairs, again, daylight egress stairs, and elevators. This view reflects the vertical movement between lower level and first level. The interior design strategy is intended to reflect simplicity and timeless materials. Exposing the structure, as you can see here, allows for the ceiling materials to be minimized and providing an impressive statement for the college. This is really where the excitement is along that corner. The open spaces are intended to have multiple programs and the collaboration areas are convertible to pre-function use outside the classroom and event space you can see on the right. The first floor accessible entrance is on the left side of the plan. The, the floor features a 100 seat, 108 seat and two 54 seat classrooms. Operable partitions offer the program flexibility and the ability to expand for the event space. The floor visually connects the users to the community and puts the program on display. The classroom spaces uh, and the building's team-based learning classrooms were designed to include flexible furniture, technology rich presentation strategies and acoustically driven interior design. These rooms have direct access to daylight and views. The second floor features a single 108 seat team team based learning classroom, group rooms, quiet study space, 24 seven market break rooms and the main office suites. Floors three through five include office suites, research labs, postdoc spaces. The corridors are programmed as well, uh, the, including study space, printing services, and access to the break rooms. Here you can see an illustration showing the typical open research lab space. The labs are, are, are designed for flexibility and reconfiguration to allow the program to uh, excel in the future as well. Here you can start to see the southeast corner. The rendering illustrates uh, its relationship to East Huron and Glen Avenue. Life cycle analysis was used, utilized throughout the design process to ensure that we we're providing the best performing envelope possible. This new, new building is two and a half times larger, but 40% more efficient in carbon emissions. The project is also projected to receive lead gold, the high performance curtain wall, proper location of energy uh, required uses, energy recovery systems all contribute to the efficiency of this building. Final illustration uh, is the Southwest corner. And you can see the main entrance on level one. The massing on the left intentionally steps down to respect the neighboring church. The selective transparency expresses the innovative nature of the program. The building self shades the lower levels and the vertical fins protect the glazing from solar heat gain. The building's materiality is intended to be cohesive with the neighborhood, but also give the College of Pharmacy its own identity. The red terracotta reflects the neighborhood's red masonry and also is similar to the terracotta on campus. There hasn't been a time in history where pharmaceutical sciences isn't more important than right now. On behalf of everyone who worked, it was involved in this project through a pandemic, no less. Uh, thank you all for allowing us to be a part of such a significant project. Thank you very much, Regent Illich. I have a quick question. Um, is there any branding, any Michigan branding that'll be on the building? We will utilize all of the standard uh, signage, monumental signs that will be on the front of the building, yes. And then there's digital displays within that glazing portion towards the bottom will really celebrate the program. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Not seeing any other questions. Thank you for your presentation. Dean, congratulations on a beautiful building. I know that this space is uh, greatly needed uh, and I can't wait to see it. And it's, it's positioned close to Taubman and Michigan Medicine is really, I think, going to be a dynamic uh, interaction uh, that uh, is also going to strengthen the university in general. So congratulations to everyone involved on that achievement. Seeing no other comments, I now call for a vote. Is there a motion? So moved. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Motion passes. Congratulations. We now move on to uh, supplemental um, items. Uh, and the first one is child care. I call on EVP Chavez. Thank you. To help support our university employees with young children, the university has been exploring innovative ways to provide child care on and near campus. The demand for services at our three existing on-campus children's centers far exceeds capacity. This issue is especially challenging for our essential hospital employees who need accessible, affordable, and flexible child care options. To better meet the needs of our medical center employees, the university would like to enter into a contractual arrangement with an experienced outside partner to design, build, and operate a child care center on university property adjacent to the hospitals. The partner would be required to comply with university building standards and design guidelines, including those related to sustainability, and the university will have final approval of building design prior to construction. We would like to secure board approval, approval today to proceed with this project and engage in a contractual agreement with an outside partner. To expedite the project, we recommend that the board delegate authority to the ex executive vice president and chief financial officer to contract with the partner, oversee design and construction of this new facility and negotiate all construction and operations related matters on this project with total expenditures not to exceed $12 million and we recommend this action for approval. Thank you, any questions? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? So moved. Is there a seconder? Seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Uh, the second supplement item has to do with Trinity uh, EBP Chattis. I'll turn to Dr. Rungit. Okay. Thank you, President Nono. Today we're asking for approval to enter a pediatric partnership with Trinity Health Oakland in Metro Detroit. This partnership will extend our pediatric subspecialty presence to Oakland County and Metro Detroit, allowing us to serve a greater population, including our existing UM Health patients in need of pediatric specialty care. Uh, this will enable growth at Trinity Oakland while allowing us to better manage capacity constraints at Mott, particularly in our neonatal intensive care unit. And it deepens our statewide relationship with Trinity Health, which is all about improving quality and access to care across Michigan. This agreement is similar to our cancer and cardiovascular network partnerships with Trinity in Western Michigan. And as you know, UM Health and Trinity Health are two strong health systems that have a long history of working together. We're pleased that this new collaboration will allow us to enhance access to advanced pediatric care for families in Metro Detroit. So I, along with Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer, Jeffrey Chattis, am requesting approval to move forward with this joint operating agreement with Trinity Health Oakland. Thank you. Are there any questions among the regents? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve? A seconder? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Congratulations. Now we have a set of items, items four through 10, that are conflict of interest uh, items each of which requires six votes for approval. So this will be one where we actually do a roll call. Does anyone have any questions about any of those items four through 10? Seeing none, would any regents like to request recusal from voting on any of those items for any reason? Seeing none, I will now call for a vote on items four to 10. Before I do that, before the roll call, is there a motion to approve? Is there a seconder? Okay, we move on to the roll call. For all items four through 10, Regent Acker. Aye. Regent Beam. Aye. Regent Bernstein. Aye. Regent Brown. Yes. Regent Hubbard. Yes. Regent Illich. Aye. Regent Weiser. Aye. Regent White. Aye. Okay, we have the six votes. 
And we know we now move on to public comments. VP Churchill. Thank you, President Eleanor, and welcome. We have a number of speakers signed up today. Each speaker has two minutes, up to two minutes, to address the board. Um, members of the board and the executive leadership team may not necessarily respond to your comments today because sometimes they require study and analysis. But I know they're all listening and uh, happy to hear from you. I'll call on our first speaker, who is Susan Gano Phillips. and I was Dean of the Flint College of Arts and Sciences until a few months ago. Most of what you know about our campus comes to you from a single voice, our chancellor. However, because of a pervasive culture of fear and intimidation promulgated by campus leadership where dissenting voices are not tolerated, the well-being of faculty, staff, and students is threatened. Many complaints and grievances have been made regarding our provost and chancellor in the past year, including allegations of discrimination, retaliation, dishonesty, coercion, bullying, and failure to engage in shared governance. But as of today, nothing has been done. I would like to think that after the Anderson, Filbert, Schlissel, and Pearson cases of misconduct, that the university's leadership would take concerns about the Flint campus administration more seriously and would connect the dots between the various reporting mechanisms. As such, I urge you to consult with university audits, the compliance hotline, and other Ann Arbor offices for their recent findings regarding our campus. The secretive transfer of three programs from CAS to CIT in June was designed to obfuscate of, uh, obvious failures of the chancellor's signature strategic initiative, the creation of the College of Innovation and Technology. CIT enrollment is just 26% of its year two goal, despite investments of hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing and scholarships for many students. Important offices on campus, such as marketing and admissions, are a revolving door. Six deans have turned over in two years, including one selected by our current provost who lasted less than eight months. And at least four key leadership positions are held by interim leaders. This turnover is causing chaos. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. A group of former high-level administrators with nearly 100 years of collective experience on this campus are eager to speak with you about their experiences, despite the risk to their professional reputations, because we care deeply about UM Flint. Please do not willfully disregard information that is essential both for the well-being of this campus and the successful transformation. We await your response. Thank you. Next up is Amina Supari. Amina Supari. Hello. All right. Good evening, President Ono, members of the Board of Regents, and the executive officers of the university. I would like to offer my sincerest congratulations to President Ono as he takes on his new role as president of the University of Michigan. I'm excited to see all that you will bring to our wonderful institution. My name is Amina Shukari, and I stand before you today to share my experience as a secondary math education student at the University of Michigan Flint. During my time here, I've met some of the best educators this university has to offer. The School of Education and Human Services is known campus-wide for going above and beyond to support all of its students. And just earlier today, SEH has hosted a historic teacher leadership symposium with just around 200 high school attendees. But even with all of their fantastic work, the lack of resources are, are on our campus is hindering the school's potential to fully support its, its students and community partners. And as stated by Chancellor Dutta earlier uh, this month, you and Flint cannot be successful without Flint being success successful. Flint schools need our help now more than ever. We provide the only teacher prep program in the region, and by not prioritizing our programs, we are contributing to the barriers that prevent many from going into the profession. From the Flint water crisis to COVID learning loss, our K-12 students face many obstacles that prevent them from excelling. And what better way to give them to give back to Flint than to provide students with well-qualified and well-trained teachers? Many of our education certificates, such as certifications in speech and French, are no longer offered on our campus. We keep hearing that U of M cares about our relationship with the Flint community, yet we can't even provide a fair investment to our future educators. As a student, I am pleased and relieved to know that university leadership is committed to improving the Flint campus. However, I am surprised to see that we have no student or community representation, excuse me, or community representation on the strategic transformation team. Including the community is crucial 
in, in, our, in advancing our own university. And I hope that our leadership will ensure that all voices are heard when we consider investing into our campus. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up is Robert Massaselli. Good afternoon. I represent CNC Hockey, and for the last two years, we've purchased the used and surplus equipment from the university. We've put over $140,000 back into the program and expected this year to be around $90,000. We pay a fair price for the equipment and for many of the items more than the university's cost. As the sale is all or none, some of the equipment we purchase is damaged or worn past its useful life and holds no value. Equipment in good condition we sell is used and is not as memorabilia. We are not set up with the university to authenticate items or with the players to sign autographs. With the caliber of players being drafted by NHL teams, some collectors would be willing to pay more and we'd be willing to work with all members of the team through NIL agreements to keep players, parents, and agents happy. We had a few other benefits to the university in providing this service, selling to CNC as a third party. The liability of the university is transferred to CNC if someone were to say, suffer a concussion wearing a Michigan helmet or injured using any piece of equipment that's been modified. We save the program time and money for the planning setup and tear down for an in-person sale. The equipment manager prefers to move everything all at once and get it out of his way as there's limited space in Yoast. The longer the equipment sits around, the less it is worth as new models are released, items come up as missing or are thrown away. We provide the equipment to the public at a fair price. A portion of our profits go towards local youth hockey, and we're sponsoring a tournament for disabled veterans with over 500 players and 30 teams coming in from all over the country. Some of them I've met through the sale and are also a Michigan alum. We were informed in mid-September by the equipment manager that we were purchasing the gear this year and to pick it up on September 25th, only to be told a few days later that the sale was canceled. I'm here to ask the regents to reinstate our agreement to purchase the gear for last year and any future years the university is willing to allow us. As a small business owner, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you. I have a question, sir, Robert. Um, were you told why it, you were uh, why it was canceled? Why you went um, to purchase the equipment and then it was canceled? Were you told why? And also, how long have you been purchasing the equipment? We purchased it how many the last years? two years. Okay, since COVID, and I was not given reason. Okay, um, so. and who told you? Who called you? Uh, the equipment manager, Ian Hume. The equipment manager where? At Ian, Michigan? Ian Hume at Michigan. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I, I think, well, you know, let us just find out what's going on. I'm surprised that you're, that you've had to come here in order to get those kinds of answers, but we'll find out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Christopher Schwartz. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Schwartz. I graduated from the University of Michigan Flint in 2016 with a Bachelor's of Arts, majoring in economics and minoring in political science. And in 2019, I graduated from the University of Michigan Law School in Ann Arbor with a law degree and passed the bar exam. I clerked on the United States Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit before working at a large law firm in Chicago. I'm here today to remind you that I am not an outlier and that contrary to the wisdom of the moment, degrees in basic social sciences and humanities are vital pathways to career success. But I'm worried others might not be able to follow the same path if the social sciences and humanities at UM Flint are not sufficiently funded, and that would be a shame. UM Flint serves underserved rural and inner city working class communities in an important way, giving them a path to become lawyers, PhDs, and policy analysts. That path must be preserved. Humanities and social science degrees provide a good pathway for jobs. According to the US Census Bureau, the unemployment rate is lower for general social science degrees than general business degrees. On average, economics majors make more than nursing majors in entry-level jobs and at mid-career, and that's just a sampling of the data. Contrary to popular intuition, social science degrees perform well in the market. However, I worry the, that UM Flint's transformation process will be hostile towards these very majors and the paths to upward mobility that they provide. So I ask the regions to get back to the basics. I ask that you provide funding so that not only nursing and business, but also STEM, the humanities and the social sciences at UN Flint can be the leaders and best. UN Flint students deserve to be supported no matter what their major and career aspirations are. And we can afford to invest in both high growth programs and support the classic fields we always have. Please fund the social sciences and the humanities at UM Flint. Okay. 
Sharia King. Sharia King. Good evening, Regents, and welcome, President Ono. I am Tariq King Jr., a lifelong resident of the great city of Flint and senior in the College of Arts and Sciences here at Flint campus. I speak to you all today on the topic of equity as we begin to reimagine U of M Flint. We need to reimagine how to make the university more affordable, accessible, and equitable for all campuses. As a first generation college student, I know firsthand the main barrier that prevents most people from attending is the tuition. After I overcame that barrier, I noticed another, which is a lack of resources our campus and Dearborn possess in comparison to the Ann Arbor campus. Here at U of M Flint, we are critical thinkers, determined, and world changers, and that is cultivated in the College of Arts and Sciences. Instead of removing programs, I implore you all to build upon the strengths of current programs, simultaneously creating new academic opportunities for all students. Let's reimagine U of M as a university that equips their students to become leaders in our society, I worry that this rethink will lead to the loss of programs that I have benefited so greatly from. For example, I am currently the youngest candidate for the Flint School Board of Education, and for my learning here, it has equipped me to better serve my community. Students and faculty here are willing to engage on this visioning process with you to ensure increase in enrollment and our institution can thrive. Along with the One University Coalition, I am asking for equitable, collaborative, and democratic participation in the allocation of funds for all three campuses. Thank you for your time and go blue. I believe, I don't know, is, is Ben Polly here? I don't believe Ben signed in. So, Sammy Fiaz Kotab. Hello? No, Ben. Go ahead. Good evening. I am Sammy Kotob. I am an early college student in my fifth year of high school, currently taking 12 credits of classes at U of M Flint. That gives me two GPAs to keep track of, my high school GPA, 4.1, my college GPA, 3.7. Currently, I am majoring in political science, and so far, my experience has been excellent. I was given the opportunity to explore and take a variety of classes. Most I enjoyed, others not so much. However, the ability to explore a variety of subjects allowed me to find what I am good at. I picked my niche among a variety of choices and a healthy institution should be inclusive of all fields of study. U of M Flint, for me, is an excellent institution precisely because it has this inclusivity. Being an early college student means that I am applying for colleges this fall, and U of M Flint is one of my top choices. However, I am concerned. I am concerned that the excellent experience I've had so far will not remain in the coming years. I am concerned that while I may be able to finish my degree, the options that I am given to do so will become increasingly limited. I implore the president, the chancellor, and the board of regents to increase funding and foster growth in all programs at U of M Flint, not just the ones currently deemed in demand by employers. If U of M Flint decides to cut funding for my intended field of, field of study, I and other students like me will not, can, will not be able to continue at a school which does not fulfill our educational needs. We will not change majors to the niche that Huron Consulting decides upon. We will pack our bags and move to an institution that does meet our educational needs. We as students need a comprehensive university that invests in a variety of fields. We need options to explore and decide on our own niche. I thank the Board of Regents for allowing me to speak here today and for giving the students an opportunity to speak. I thank them for taking the time to consider the needs of their students, and I implore the Board of Regents, the President, and the Chancellor to continue maintaining U of M Flint as an excellent, excellent destination for the humanities, the liberal arts, and all other educational fields. Thank you, and go blue. Thank you. Alexis Woodard. Hello, my name is Alexis Woodard. I'm a senior here at the University of Michigan in Flint, and I grew up in the Genesee County area in Grand Blanc and come from a working class background. Early on, it became clear that attending college and the cost of that experience was my personal burden to carry. 
Like many students, I had family, community, and religious obligations in the area, so I decided that the only perfect option for my college education was the University of Michigan in Flint. I got a job to pay for my classes and signed up to de as a declared Spanish major. My time here at UM Flint has been quite comprehensive. I've taken classes ranging from biology, music theory, gender studies, English, critical thinking, linguistics, anthropology, and Spanish. I came here for just this exact education, especially since UM Flint is the only university in the area that provides all of these resources to students. What I have learned by being a part of these programs has been integral not only to receiving my bachelor's degree, but developing my personal sense of identity and setting me on my future career path. Throughout my time here, however, I've seen how these program, programs have suffered from disinvestment, including my own program, Spanish. I'm not only saddened by this, but I'm extremely concerned for others. It would be a dangerous mistake to further diminish any other liberal arts or science programs from this community. If these programs were to be taken away, some students might just leave the community for another public university, but many more, just like students like me, would not have an option to study these things at all because of their circumstances. I hope you are ready to be held responsible for this. The university has hired a consulting firm, Huron Consulting, who has carelessly attacked and dismantled the liberal arts and sciences at university after university. If you think UM Flint students matter as you profess, you should be investing in all of the things that make UM Flint a great asset for its students and community, the liberal arts, sciences, technical education, and the professional schools. Any choice between these three is a false choice. Your action or inaction will reflect reflect your priorities, and it is my hope that UM Flint community, our whole community, is among these priorities. Thank you for your time. Chair Brown, Chair Brown. Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, um, Alexis. Uh, have you participated or had a chance to participate in any of the you know, scheduled uh, mechanisms for contributing to the. Hi, um, no, because I was, I just found out about this happening, but I will continue to be concerned about this and be involved in any way that I can to just figure out what to, what to do about this, <laughs> essentially. So, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the next speaker. Jason Kuznowski. You're Jason. Yeah, I'm Jason. Sorry, I didn't hear. Hi, um, my name is Jason Kuznowski, and I'm an associate professor of political science here at University of Michigan Flint. Before I start, um, Chris, Ture, and Sam have all been my students at at various points. I'm dwelling right now. I know some people know what that means on the on the board. You can, if you don't know, ask. Anyway, on to my talk. Um, so before I was a professor here at U of M Flint, I was actually a graduate student at the New School for Social Research in New York City. Whereas 14th Street and Fifth Avenue seems like a million miles away from Saginaw Street, the two institutions actually have one very important thing in common. They were both founded for people that traditional academia deemed unworthy of inclusion. For those who don't know, uh, the New School was founded in 1919 to house scholars who had been fired for protesting against US participation in World War I. The graduate faculty, uh, specifically where I got my PhD, um, was found in the 30s to give jobs and more importantly visas to German Jewish scholars who needed to flee but could not get jobs in US academia. It was originally called the University in Exile because of that role. Jürgen Flint was founded to give another a group of people a chance to be included in academia who many thought shouldn't be there. Working class students, Harding Mott, who gave the money to found Jürgen Flint, insisted that it be a true U of M campus so that students of the area would have the same chances and opportunities as those who attended the Ann Arbor campus. Sadly, these two schools have another more dubious distinction. Huron Consulting has been hired to quote unquote rethink both of these institutions. At the new school that entailed laying off hundreds of employees when Huron was hired to consult for the University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point, not only were there layoffs, but program cuts and closures. Huron does not share the values of either the New School or U of M Flint. They were founded by members, uh, Huron was founded by members of disgraced accounting firm Arthur Anderson, a firm that played a huge role in the Enron scandal. They specialize in aligning curriculum with quote unquote business leads. They advise universities to declare financial crisis and use the shock doctrine to justify their cuts. These are not the values of inclusion, student-centeredness, and civic engagement that the University of Michigan touts as our own. So I ask you one simple thing, fire Huron Consulting. Thank you. I actually have a list 
a, a fact sheet. I'm going to give this to you about Huron Consulting. Can I give those to you for distribution? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I am a young black queer woman raised in the city of Flint. My entire life, I knew I wanted to help myself and my community. I was always raised with the mindset that as a black person living in America, you needed to be at least two times better than your counterparts and you needed to make sure that you help the next person that looked like yourself. I took these words to heart and originally planned to enter the medical field and until I met Dr. Kimberly Sachs McManaway, who introduced me to public policy. I am now a senior expected to graduate in April of 2023, and I am a project administrator at a consulting firm in Detroit, Michigan. I'm a research assistant on campus, and I am in the process of starting a nonprofit to create equitable spaces for minority students. I could not have accomplished this degree nor my aspirations without the guidance of professors within the liberal arts or the support of my community within the city of Flint. My story is not unique, Regents. I come to you as a representative of Black Student Union and want to provide insight about similar stories of Black students on campus that look like me and come from areas similar to Flint. The University of Michigan Flint has created many partnerships, such as the Greater um, Genesee Early College, which I graduated from, which provides dual enrolled classes and also has a Promise Scholar program, which allows students from the community school districts to come and receive college education. Others will not find these paths to be a ma meaningful career and upward mo mobility without the support of U of M Flint and other surrounding campuses. Students from academically and economically disadvantaged communities such as Flint may not have much exposure to colleges or institutions, and the elimination of the liberal arts program can take away even more opportunities for these students. Expanding upon the fact that these communities are historically disadvantaged, Many students may have trauma and stress indicators during their college journey as well. And this University of Michigan Flint remaining in this community provides hope and allows students to return while being in a city like Flint. The University of Michigan Flint has stated within their diversity, equity, and inclusion mission that their desire is to make an impact and to continuously improve the institution. And as I look in this room, I ask that you shape the new institution to look for people like me and to have more representation across the board. Thank you. Michelle Dietrich. Go ahead. Yeah. Good afternoon, President Ono and Regents. I'm Michelle Regalado Dietrich. I'm a University of Michigan Ann Arbor alum with both a graduate degree in higher education administration and policy and professional experience teaching at every level from middle school through community college and adult ed. I'm a former county commissioner dedicated to ensuring vibrant local education and communities. And I'm also the daughter of a teenage Latina mother but the first on either side of our family to finish college, enabling us to join the middle class. As you know, our public universities are vital to the growth, health, and happiness of our families, communities, and our state. The decisions you face are so important, and I fully support a transparent decision-making process regarding the Flint and Dearborn campuses with inclusive, ample public input, and I'm really grateful for President Ono's commitment to that. Thank you. My mother's free community college and then four-year public university were vibrant, comprehensive learning centers, even though our community was not wealthy or powerful because of equitable state investments in higher education institutions. I understand the very real thorny issues that you face around enrollment and revenue, but I also know that my mother, like the people of the economically struggling neighborhood that I grew up in, and the people of Flint and Dearborn deserve equity and the opportunity for affordable, full breadth college educations. After graduating, my mother entered the business world and became a marketing professional. And she was the first to say that her considerable success directly resulted from her coursework in literature and history, psychology and biology, an education that got her to think critically, to write analytically, to speak with confidence and authority. It changed her life and it changed mine because her education meant that I grew up with books around me and the love of learning. For my students, whether they have been 17 or 70, the liberal arts have also been a source of joy and of nourishment and of a thriving culture and economy in their communities. So I look forward to your work to support 
flourishing comprehensive universities in Ann Arbor, Flint, and Dearborn equally. Thank you. Hello, my name is Douglas Kinnear, and I'm a professor of history at UM Flint and currently serving as interim dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. I want to begin by thanking the regents, President Ono, President Emerita, Mary Sue Coleman, and other key leaders for their support of the Flint Campus Strategic Transformation Project. I want to assure you that there is a majority of faculty and staff on the Flint campus who are fully engaged with the challenges facing higher education and are committed to Chancellor Dutta's vision to sustain the Flint campus as an academically strong, programmatically relevant, and financially viable institution. At the Strategic Transformation Town Hall, the theme of community was strong. I and many others believe that it is imperative that faculty, staff, and students work together across the campus, challenging each other to break the boundaries of prior assumptions and practices, and to think boldly about our responsibilities to each other and to the Flint community, the community responsible for the founding of our campus 66 years ago. The citizens of Flint who helped establish the University of Michigan Flint, true visionaries and path-breaking entrepreneurs, knew the importance of higher education and the sustaining opportunities it brings. The daring actions of that generation provides a foundation for our campus and community to work in new ways. We remain grounded in our commitment to the transformation of our students, but with our eyes wide open in addressing the tectonic changes in the higher education sector and the political, social, and economic realities behind them. Rest assured that we are about the business of transformation for the benefit of our students, our city and region, and for the University of Michigan as a whole. Thank you and go blue. Thank you. Emily, you're not. Uh, so thank you so much for coming forward. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of perspectives out there and certainly support your comments and support the transformation going on here. And, I hope that you and the colleagues that you speak of will continue to stay involved in the process, as well as all of you here in the audience. Thank you. Emily? Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all today. My name is Emily Fewerherm. I'm an Associate Professor of Linguistics here at UM Flint. I'm so proud to be part of the University of Michigan system, and I love its focus on DEI. I'm also passionate about it. Um, I work with a diverse group, minoritized language speakers, people who speak languages like Spanish or Arabic, as well as Native American languages and ASL. Unfortunately, in the eight years I've worked here, I've seen our humanities and world language programs gutted. We used to have multiple majors and minors focused in Spanish, but now only a Spanish minor remains, as you heard. There are almost no advanced world language classes left in any language. What this means is we will have fewer world language teachers and speakers in our area. Our children will have less access to the diversity that comes from learning additional languages. It also means that we are graduating fewer nurses, computer scientists, and business majors who have learned an additional language. And it is well documented that being bilingual increases your job success and advancement and even increases your cognitive abilities. It's not just a UM Flint DEI issue, it's a community issue. Multilingual residents in this community need access and support to resources too. Lack of world languages risks our place in an increasingly diverse country and globalized economy. These cutbacks have been the result of austerity measures at UM Flint, which has left the world language programs without a single tenure track faculty member to guide innovative program development. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Ann Arbor, millions have been invested in DEI efforts, and there are robust humanities and world language programs to choose from. Our students deserve broad and diverse learning opportunities, and our community needs people who can communicate across boundaries. Our students deserve an equitable education. Investing in Flint means investing in the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Board of Regents, 
President Anu, thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I am Mushtaba Vizuri, a physics and engineering faculty that have served this place for over 33 years. And one of the faculty indeed that moved to the new College of Info, uh, Innovation and Technology this summit. I wanna take it this moment to also thank the UN Fluent Provost and Chancellor and Board of Region for acting on our request to move this program to the new college. I want to tell you that the faculty who moved are very excited, energetic, and they all appreciate the effort made to make this move happen. It is important that you hear this. Right now, we all, all faculty are engaged, fully engaged in a college-wide discussion in this new college on the curriculum and how to enhance it with hands-on activity to better serve our student and the community. We are strive to make a program that meets the need of our student as we have done in the past. We are fully invested in making UM Flint a great destination for prospective students. I also want to thank the Board of Regents for investing in the strategic transformation initiative for the Flint campus. In my 30 years here, I've seen a lot of up a lot of initiative, but nothing at this level. I also, I recognize that there is a lot of changes that needs to be done to have a better place. But one thing I can say on a personal note is this, I hope we can come up with a way to have a, a smooth and seamless transfer pathway for students at UN Flint and between the three campuses. Thank you for your attention. And we have a lot of that one, I wanna add one. I, I think UN Flint has done so much for the community that it's unfair not to mention it. I've been here, I said 33 years, I have sent a student to Berkeley that even Ann Arbor didn't accept it. And his thesis, his first paper was published in Nature. I wanna tell this to President Anuk that so he knows what we are talking about, okay? I, we sent a student to Yale and all our graduates are, are great. Yeah. Some of us What? Some of us Oh, okay. All right. We got to keep moving on public comment here. We have others that are waiting to speak. Shabib Debaja, sorry. Thank you. Um, I'll try to keep my uh, comments uh, to a minimum today. My name is Shabib Debaja. I am uh, the student body vice president. I'm a senior here on the University of Michigan Flint's campus, uh, studying in economics and pre medicine, which in our terms is 18 credits a year for the four and a half years that I've been here. Um, I planned on speaking on the tr strategic transformation project and a lot of different things within my speech today, but hearing a lot of the comments today and some of our commentary by the board, I feel that it is needed that we have some positivity about our campus and the student experience on our campus. I entered the university in the fall of 2018 with the full intention to transfer to Ann Arbor after one semester. And here I am in the fall of 2022, still a student and a student leader on campus. This university gives so many unique opportunities for students to grow as leaders and best with faculty and staff that really offer an avenue for growth as students. The vice chancellor, Dr. Giordano, asked me to speak before uh, you all today to offer that type of insight and what left me here on this campus. I was able to start something that I was passionate in, our own baseball team on campus, the club baseball team. 
I serve as TJ Brooks's vice president and am able to have com communications with the chancellor and the vice chancellor and the dean of students. The thing I want to leave the Board of Regents with today and all of our students, there's an old saying, if you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. I think everyone showed a lot of passion here today for the presence of our future. Another phrase that I'd like to leave is one that Pericles left to the Athenians. We do not imitate for we are leaders and models for the future. And that is what I see before us today with this new strategic transformation process and processes moving forward. I thank you so much for your time and your consideration today and go blue. Thank you. Sadie Wilson. She's not in the room. Hello, good afternoon. My phone has died, so we are just going to do this on a whim. All right. Thank you so much, President Ono, Dr. Dutta, Chancellor Dutta, and the Board of Regents for being here today. We thank you. We appreciate you. My gosh, I had a whole speech that is no longer with me, but we're gonna make it work. So thank you for everything that you do and thank you for supporting us during our strategic transformation. Um, I am currently the chair of staff council here at the University of Michigan Flint. So on behalf of the staff council, I thank you and I welcome you and I hope that you enjoy your time in Flint. And knowing that you're here, President Ono, for the first time, for your first meeting, is an incredible honor. So thank you so much. It says a lot about you and your intentions with this campus. So there's a really awesome, amazing advisor on the Ann Arbor campus. Her name is Lisa Hull. She is an advisor and she once described Flint campus and Dearborn campus as sister campuses. And ever since then, it's never left my mind. So thank you for acknowledging us, respecting us, and seeing us as a sister campus. So on behalf of staff council, thank you. And we are more than happy to support you in meeting your goals and expectations for not only this amazing campus, but the Flint community. So thank you. Thank you. I believe Lisa Borio is not here, is that correct? Lisa is not here. So our next speaker is, actually our last speaker is Ted McTapp. My name is Ted McTaggart. I'm the dispute chair for MNA UNPNC, the nurses union at U of M. First of all, I want to extend a warm welcome to President Ono on behalf of our union and the University of Michigan labor community. At last month's Board of Regents meeting, you heard from UNPNC President Renee Curtis about the tentative agreement we reached with U of M the night before. I'm pleased to report that our membership voted by a 95% margin to ratify this agreement. We're thankful for the advocacy of the regions who helped to bring this landmark agreement about. Among other wins, our new contract puts an end to forced overtime, which had been used widely throughout our institution for years at great moral and physical harm to our nurses. We borrowed language from a Massachusetts law that outlaws forced overtime, except in very clearly defined emergency situations, such as a government declared state of, emer of emergency that requires additional healthcare resources, mass casualty events, and major hospital-wide disturbances such as a riot or power failure. Our team knew that it would, might be a challenge to eliminate forced overtime overnight, I made the offer during bargaining to allow a grace period for the employer to get their house in order by a certain specified date several months in the future. The employer politely declined our offer, stating, we prefer to just rip the Band-Aid off all at once. Since ratification on October 1st, our union has received numerous reports of forced overtime being used in violation of our new contract. We are following the contractual remedies to address the situation, but wish to use this forum to express our dismay and disappointment to you, Board of Regents, and to President Ono. A new contract offers the opportunity for a new beginning, a reset in labor management relations that have been strained for a number of years. 
We, the leaders of MNA UMPNC, are eager to partner with you to bring about a new era of prosperity for our health system based on mutual respect and regard for the health, safety, and well being of our patients and employees alike. Despite this rocky start, we are hopeful we can put the past behind us and work together for the common good. Thank you. Thank you. Widget Brown. Thank you. Um, this actually does not conclude the agenda. Uh, we've changed it around a little bit, but I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the speakers. It's a really important opportunity for the Board of Regents to hear from the community. Um, and we do listen and we do follow up. And I know how difficult and hard it can be to, to stand up there in front of this big crowd. I've done it before myself. Um, so sincerely, thank you, everyone who spoke today. Thank you, Regent Brown. Yes, so Donna will introduce uh, two presentations, one on sustainability and the other on uh, enrollment analysis. Chancellor Dutta. Thank you, President Nono. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Heather Dawson, who is a professor of biology uh, in the School of Arts and Sciences, in the College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Heather received her bachelor's from U of M Ann Arbor and her PhD from Michigan State. She has worked um, in the public sector and has been a longtime faculty member here. I want to add that when we started the new Office of Research and Economic Development, Heather was the first executive director. And for the two years that she led the office, she did remarkable for this campus. So thank you, Heather. And now the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Chancellor Dutta. Um, so a special welcome, of course, to our new president, President Ono. Thank you, Regents, everyone, for being here. It's a pleasure to speak with you. Uh, like uh, Chancellor Dutta said, I'm, my name is Heather Dawson. I'm a professor of biology here at U of M Flint. I'm speaking for many on, on our campus, so take my presentation as just one example of so much work that's being silently done here. I'm speaking specifically about sustainability on U of M Flint's campus our partnership and sustainability with the city of Flint, and my own research on the ecology of the Flint River and its sustainability. I had the pleasure of serving as a faculty co-lead for the biosequestration internal analysis team for the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality, and I serve on the University Unit's Leadership Council to advance the PCCN's objectives. Uh, next slide. Chancellor Dutta puts high value on sustainability and formed the Sustainability Committee at U of M Flint and asked me and a staff member to lead it. Uh, the Sustainability Committee has helped to launch uh, Planet Blue Ambassadors Program, are hiring a full-time sustainability programs coordinator for our campus with the help of the Graham Institute in Ann Arbor. Um, we also uh, were consultant and helped to launch uh, new curricular programs that are focused on sustainability and are also investigating fleet electrification and working with consumers energy to receive campus electricity through renewable resources in the near future. People on this committee organize a sustainability week that will happen um, this fall. Uh, we're receiving a big uh, $500,000 check in energy efficiency rebates from consumers energy that week. Go back. Uh, sustainability, sustainability Week will also include talks, including one by a visiting professor from the University of Oxford on community-based conservation, lightning talks by students, an art exhibition, a zero waste event for our Veterans Day breakfast, and a community and campus Flint River cleanup. Uh, faculty and Sustainability Committee member Rebecca Tonietto is actually studying lawn alternatives on our campus. So this is a um, uh, picture on the left is seeded with a low uh, mow, low water variety mixed with flowers. Um, and the lawns can become more sustainable, right? And ecologically friendly if we rethink them. So that's some research that's going on on our campus. We also reached out to the city of Flint about their interest in co-creating an environmental sustainability plan for the city. Uh, they were interested and we have been working toward this for a year now. So the working group besides the leaders uh, stated there include um, uh, folks from Kettering, uh, the community, community environmental agencies, the EPA and U of M Flint students. We've tried to obtain funding from the state for this effort but have so far been unsuccessful. At our last meeting, we discussed not only issues at hand in Flint right now, 
but that Michigan and the Flint area is being projected as places that will receive people emigrating due to climate change in the future. So these types of things actually highlight the importance of the efforts that we're doing right now. Um, the city's environmental sustainability plan, like the city's master plan, has a plan to implement a blue-green infrastructure system that creates open space, parks and trails that follow the Flint River and its tributaries. So the Flint River Restoration Project is actually outlined in the picture at the top left. It's a $40 million effort that has been underway and helps to lead toward that blue-green infrastructure. The top right picture shows our campus right along the river, uh, right close to us right now. The bottom left picture shows just the above water structure of a century old dam on our campus just across from us being removed. And then that bottom right picture actually shows an artist's rendering of that dam site in the future, revealing access to the river, recreational activities in the river once that dam's completely removed. My and my students' research focuses on studying the ecology of the Flint River above and below that century old dam on our campus. It's scheduled to be completely removed next year with a final bit of funding coming from the bipartisan infrastructure law which prompted a visit to Flint by the Assistant Secretary of Fish and Wildlife and Parks this past summer. This Flint River Ecology Study aims to study before, during, and after restoration and highlight this positive resource to the community. Long-term goals are to make this site a National Science Foundation long-term ecological research site if possible. This shows a picture of Flint in its heyday in the 1960s when we know that population levels were at their peak. We know a lot has happened since then. Environmental injustices have happened in Flint many times over many years. U of M Flint and its people uh, are committed to helping to get environmental justice for the community and growing the community. Here's an example of how beautiful some of our spaces can become with the abandoned Chevy factory, um, uh, often called Chevy in the Hole, pictured on the left. And then the picture on the right showing the transformation of that exact site into a green space now called Chevy Commons. So this is an area that's due to become part of Michigan's newest and Genesee County's only state park. So essentially, we're very excited about the future of U of M Flint and the city of Flint. And uh, we hope you are too. Thank you very much for your time. And now I would like to invite Joe Vayner, who is the Director of Undergraduate Admissions at U of M Flint. Uh, Joe came to us from Eastern, Eastern Michigan University just a short while ago, probably about 15 months ago. Joe has a BA in English from, from Cleveland State, MFA in Creative Writing from Sarah Lawrence College, and MA in Education Leadership from Eastern Michigan. I just want to say that the progress that we have made uh, this year, which Joe is going to talk to you about, is a lot of hard work that these three individuals have provided leadership for. It's, it's tremendous. So thank you, Joe, Lori, and, and Chris Lewis. Joe, now it's yours. Thank you for the warm introduction. And I'd like to thank the members of the Board of Regents and President Ono for giving me the opportunity to speak for a few minutes this evening about the University of Michigan Flint's recent success, both recruiting and retaining students. This fall, UM Flint achieved a overall 8% increase in new degree-seeking student enrollment. This increase was spread across all major student populations. We included a 6% increase in new first-year students, a 10% increase in undergraduate transfers, and a 6% increase in new undergraduate students. Or, I'm sorry, new graduate students, I apologize. Uh, of more than 1,000 new undergraduates who enrolled at UM Flint this fall, 10% were awarded the Go Blue Guarantee Scholarship. Extending the scholarship to the Flint campus has helped generate interest in UM Flint throughout the state of Michigan. At the same time, 60% of our first year students and 48% of our new transfer students received merit scholarships from the University of Michigan Flint. 
not only did we do a better job of attracting new students this fall, we also improved our retention of continuing students. And I'll add, even in the face of continuing challenges related to COVID-19 that have provided consistent retention challenges to universities and colleges throughout the United States. Um, this fall, we improved our retention to a, we have a 77% retention of fall 21 first year students who are currently enrolled here in fall 22. Uh, that's a 7% increase over our rate from the previous year. Uh, with the number of Michigan high school graduates projected to decline well into the next decade, improving retention is an essential part of meeting our enrollment goals. Our staff and faculty are working to improve student retention by ensuring that the classroom experience is high quality and supportive, by offering gateway courses in a cohorted format, by extending orientation and reinforcing its messages through multiple channels, and by creating new opportunities for campus and community engagement and student mentorship. The University of Michigan Flint implemented many new improvements that resulted in this year's increase in new student enrollment. We brought online a new CRM, which has enabled us to better communicate with prospective students and to track the effectiveness of our communications. Um, at the same time, we implemented a new marketing and branding strategy informed by extensive market research. We placed a renewed focus on, renewing, on recruiting students from Genesee County, while at the same time expanding our offerings of fully online programs with the goal of making the University of Michigan Flint more accessible to students from both within and outside of mid-Michigan. Uh, we achieved large increases in international student enrollment due in large part to our application sharing agreement with the Ann Arbor campus. This is the first year that the partnership has included international students. And I'm happy to say that about 40% of our new international first year students came by way of this partnership and application sharing initiative. Uh, rest assured, no one on this campus is content with having one good year. On the recruitment side, we've used predictive modeling to improve our merit scholarship model for the upcoming fall 23 season, uh, increased the prominence of the Go Blue Guarantee in our marketing efforts, and personalized our new student communication in large part because of the new CRM that we brought on board last year. Uh, we've expanded our international partnerships and plan to resume international recruitment travel this winter. Um, on the retention side, our academic units are analyzing uh, course outcomes on a, you know, student outcomes on a class by class basis. Uh, this year's success, both in recruitment and in retention, have provided the foundation for total for our total enrollment to stabilize and eventually to grow. The strategic transformation process in which UM Flint is currently engaged will push us to offer high demand programs, and I'll say high demand both on the employer side as well as on the student side, and to become a top choice university for Michigan students. Once again, thank you to the members of the board, President Ono and Chancellor Dutta for the opportunity to speak this evening. Thank you very much for that outstanding work and for that presentation. Chancellor, thank you so much for hosting. Thanks to everyone from UM Flint for coming and for providing that feedback. Much appreciated. The meeting is adjourned.